Um, thanks for everybody for joining today. I know um, the land or a Zoom marathon. Um, Chris can't <clears throat> be part of this today. He's on another Zoom meeting. Um, but I just want to acknowledge Cliff Little and Bob Hendershot, and uh, I did steal a slide from Dr. Parker um, <clears throat> for some of this. Um, I put some of the fencing stuff together, and Chris added some stuff from the, from the grazing programs on the water system. So um, we'll try to make this as quick as possible. Um, I'm going to kind of do this in a tongue-in-cheek manner today. So if you don't learn anything, maybe I can put a smile on your face, and it's still a win for both of us. So. Um, just want to make sure that we are clear on which fencing we are talking about today. Um, clearly, if you know Chris and I, neither one of us are athletic enough or coordinated enough to do the fencing on the right. So we are going to be talking about livestock fencing. Okay. So if we are going to be doing some fencing, do we really need to do anything? I kind of put that out there tongue in cheek again, um, but we do have areas of this country that are still open range. Um, that slide on the bottom with that solar panel on that kind of a looking helmet there for that animal, those they started using um, just to track the animals, mostly out west or in areas um, that were large, extremely large fields just to track the animals. Um, I don't know how well those held up with the kids or the animals starting to want to scratch their head and how those solar panels held up, um, but they have <clears throat> used some, there are some dog colors for hunting dogs. Um, I know Dr. Parker had mentioned that they have used those where they put them around the necks of cattle and just simply to track them and track their movement across pasture fields um, just to see where all they're going to. Um, but what some of the newer technology, then this is what Dr. Um, Parker talked about at the High Forage and Grasslands Council here a couple months ago, um, is that they are developing some virtual fencing. Um, kind of like the virtual fencing you would have for your dog. They're not burying a wire in the ground, but putting in the GPS coordinates and trying to get these cattle to move um, where they wanted them to. A beep would, would sound um, and try to deter them from going on, um, although they did have some animals that didn't really obey that sound. Once they got past that GPS coordinate, they would quit, quit shocking them. Um, but this is technology that is being developed. And whenever I get in front of a crowd, especially when I'm doing a fencing talk, um, I, we need to keep hammering on these guys to call 811 um, or the call before you dig number. Um, a lot of people don't realize that if we're digging post holes, that is excavating. Um, this group has been at our national meeting for the last seven years or so at um, NACA. Um, great folks to work with. Just remind your producers they're not bothering these people when they call them. They want you to call them because um, some pretty serious things can happen. It, I mean, if you hit one of these fiber cables, it's thousands of dollars a day in the fines. Um, so you want to make sure you know where all those utilities are um, and avoid them if we're going to be digging some post holes or building fence by driving posts. So if we're going to build a fence, do we really need to know where the boundaries are. Um, pretty important that you do, um, especially if you're dealing with some producers that have just bought a farm. Make sure they know where those corner pins are, where those property lines are, because um, you don't want to make the mistake of putting a lot of money into a fence, um, building that fence, and only to find out you've got to move it or you've given up ground. There are um, regulations on line fence, and on the last slide, or next to the last slide in this presentation, I'll put up Peggy Hull's um, tax sheet that she did on the new fence line laws um, that came out in 2008. But NRCS Dove has standards um, for building fence if you wanted to follow those. Um, and what they were, um, would recommend. So when we're starting out, we want to look at an overview of the land. How many hollows are we going to go over and through? Are we going to go around woods? Um, how many pastures are we going to put in? Um, you know, how long is that fence? Um, a lot of us don't have deep pockets and can't build all the fence that we want to at once. Um, so which are the critical areas that we need um, to build first? Um, and what are those conditions? Um, a lot of areas on my place, I'm digging through rock and roots. Um, and there in that middle slide, some of these newer um, postal diggers that have these um, rock bits on them. Um, I just purchased one that works really well through roots. I haven't really got into some serious rock with it yet, um, but I've been impressed with it so far. Um, out west, you know, they're putting using a lot of steel posts out there just because they've got some really rocky conditions. Um, so 
that is an option as well, or even doing something like this with these concrete blocks and um, being innovative that way. What about low-lying areas where we're going to have water gates that we're going to need to put in? Certainly this image in the middle isn't something that we want to have or see um, with all the water quality issues that we have now. Um, water gates, there's a lot of different designs of those, just depending on how big of a flow you're going to have coming through that stream. Are you going to have some pretty serious logs coming through that's going to rip those out? Um, a lot of different adaptations, and I'll show you one variation here later on, but um, we really want to limit um, livestock in waterways. What about if we're along roads? People often ask, you know, what, what kind of fence should I put along a road? And most of the time my answer is, well, what will allow you to sleep at night um, if you've got animals along a road? Um, your perimeter fences should be your heavier fences, your um, more stable fences. And just this picture <clears throat> right here on the right, just a pet peeve of mine, you know, which side is, is the livestock on that fence? They're on the right side. Where'd they put the wire? On the left side. Why? Because it looks nice. But we want to put that fence or those boards on the side that the livestock are, okay? Staples are just designed to hold the wire up. Um, so if the animals, there is no juice on that fence, if they're pushing on it, they're not going to be pushing the staples out. <clears throat> if you look at that picture in the bottom of the center, um, there were dividing those pastures up like Rory and Christine talked about earlier today. Um, every farm is different. You know, when we talk about fencing, that's another one of our depends answers just because it depends on the layout of that farm. You can see that they have these um, paddocks laid out across that slope, not up and down that slope. Um, I kind of like seeing these layouts. Does a couple things for you. It prevents those animals from making paths straight up and down that hill to increase erosion. And also, you're grazing different sections of that slope off at different times. So if we do get a heavy rain, some of that, you're going to have some sod on that hillside somewhere to help slow that erosion down, OK? <clears throat> fence type. We have come a long way with fence, OK? Fencing can be expensive. So we need to be aware of that. And we'll get into what species we're gonna have. And there again, you can see another, that's my pet peeve too there. They've got the boards on the wrong side of that fence and that animal's pushing his head underneath it. Um, and pretty soon they're gonna pop those boards off there. It doesn't make any difference whether you put it on the screws or nails. Um, eventually they're gonna work it loose. How much land do you have? How many animals are you gonna be running through this? Um, you know, Christine and Roy did a great job talking about different species and maximizing your use of your pastures. Um, but just have plans in the back of your head. You know, Roy talked about, we've got that flush in the spring, so how are we gonna take care of that? But what if we run into a drought? What if we have areas that flood? Um, we've gotta have our fencing systems flexible enough um, that we can adapt and be able to move. So the type of fence you have will largely be dictated by what species you have. If you have multiple species, I always encourage people to go to the smallest species. You look at that picture of the goat there. Um, if that was a horn goat, what, would, what kind of an issue would we have there? Certainly they could get their head through those stays, through their horns, but the horns are curved back over their head when that goat tried to pull its head back out of there. Um, one of two things are both going to happen. He's going to, or she's going to severely injure themselves, or they're just going to shred that new fence that you just put up. Um, so with goats, I jokingly with people tell them if their fence won't hold water, it's not going to keep a goat in. And certainly that critter in the middle of the picture with the horse is showing you that. Um, with horses, visibility is a big issue. There's a lot of tapes and ropes, and I'll show you some examples of those out there um, <clears throat> that are available. Not so much for a permanent. They can be, um, just depending on what kind of critters you've got and how hard they're pushing on the fence. Um, these calves that are obviously on the wrong side of the fence, I don't like to see that. Um, my experience is that, you know, if they don't respect that fence when they're young, they're going to be tougher to train to it as they get older. Um, you know, we want them, I want my animals to respect that fence at all ages and have it. That's my fault for not having the fence and where it needs to be. Granted, that may just be in a hay field or another paddock. Um, no problems if they get out, but I just don't like seeing that. With pigs, we can fence them in with electric as well. Um, a lot of people are going to pasture pork, um, but the thing with pigs, we've got this low wire down here, so when they put their snout on it, they'll get shocked. But the thing you got to watch with pigs, you know, they are many bulldozers, so 
um, they will root that up and a lot of times they'll just root dirt over top of that wire and they will short it out. So just be aware of that. So what kind of fence are we going to build? Um, we, a permanent fence, we'd want something with at least 20 years of lifespan, whether we're going with woven, um, barbed, high tensile, um, wood, um, doesn't really matter. <clears throat> we, we want something that's going to be pretty significant and it's going to be around for a while. Um, recycled plastic, um, there have been in the past um, some folks that have used these recycled plastic posts. Um, they are kind of nice. You don't have to use an insulator. You can just um, staple the electric wire right to it. Just one downfall that I've seen with those is if you do have any pressure on that post with the wire, um, gets hot in the summer, those posts will bend because they are made of plastic. So just something to be aware with those. Semi-permanent. <clears throat> We can use permanent materials for our semi-permanent fence. Um, there's all kinds of these ropes and tapes and different widths and different colors out there. Those work nice. Um, obviously the ones that are more expensive are the ones going to have on these tapes and ropes that have more wire in them to carry that charge. If you're going to put a charge on it, more than likely you will. Um, then different grades of plastic, some of them are more UV resistant than others, so you just want to be aware of that um, if you're going to be using them. Fence chargers, probably one of the biggest mistakes that folks make, um, at least it's in my top five um, with fence, is the chargers themselves. Um, when you look at when you're looking at buying a fence charger, they'll put on there it's good for 10 miles, it's good for 25 miles. Um, I don't pay any attention to that. You want to know how many joules that fence charger is putting out. Um, you know, for the engineers in the group, a joule is a voltage times amps times time um, is how they get that number. Um, but they're anywhere out there from a quarter joule to a hundred joules. Um, kind of think of it as horsepower. Some folks may say. I'd say it'll give you, it's more forgiving, the higher the jewels and more forgiving by being able to take more weeds on it. Um, it won't ground out as easy. Okay, kind of think of it that way. I mean, there's ones that are AC that, and the solar panel ones have really, or the solar chargers have really come a long way in the last few years, especially with the battery life um, that those have. And just a couple of these that I have on there, again, not in our, um, promoting any brand over another one by any means. <clears throat> but that speed right one there, you can see they've got their um, electric detector there with that um, to see whether you're, you've got a ground. And those will even tell you what direction the ground is in, um, which really makes it nice. The other one there, that is that Gallagher there, the orange one, that is the 100 joule charger. Um, it's about three grand, um, but it will put out you know, some some um, energy to it. It does have this nice um, wireless display that you could put a, up to 150 foot away, um, put it in your shop and see what that charger's doing. And some of these chargers actually with this handheld device that they have there, if you're out checking fence, you can lay that on there. And if you know, see you've got an issue you got to fix, you can lay it on there and hit a button and it'll actually turn the charger off for you. Um, back at the shop or wherever you have the charger at. And if you do need to do some fence repair, repair the fence, put it back on there, hit the button, and it'll turn the charger back on for you, okay? And Julie, if anybody comes up with any questions, just go ahead and jump in anytime. Um, doesn't matter to me. <clears throat> probably another, the biggest, um, not the biggest in my opinion, but probably the second biggest mistake a lot of folks make is not putting enough ground rods on their electric fence. And the way we want to do this is with your charger, you'll need at least three ground rods spacing them 10 feet apart. Okay, I don't care how many jewels you got, the more grounding rods you have on it, the better it's going to work. But then also, if you just have a wire on your fence line that's not going to have juice on it, ground that to your charger as well. Okay, that way when that animal touches both of those, it'll make good contact, give them a good charge, and deter them from pushing on your fence any harder. And some would even recommend that if you've got more than 1,500 feet away from your charger, just put another ground rod out there in that fence anywhere, especially if we get a dry year because that char current has to go from that animal through the ground and back to the charger or to back to the ground rods, okay? So the more ground rods you have, um, 
the better that charge is going to carry and better zap it's going to give that critter to turn them around. Another issue we sometimes run into, not so much anymore, um, back when we used to have a lot of dairies, a lot of the smaller dairies, um, this used to be an issue that would come up with stray voltage. Um, to properly install a charger, you'd want to put that charger at least 50 foot away from the utility ground. Okay, and then also water lines and those kind of things can be a problem. You know, in the dairy parlors, we had a lot of metal, um, you know, buried in concrete and it did um, create some problems. You know, animals would go up to take a drink out of the water tank, you know, and there would be an electric charge in there and it doesn't take much, just three, four or five amps is enough to deter an animal from drinking water. And then after that production goes down, um, so just be aware of that, that that can be an issue. If we're going to bury any wire underground, you know, whether we're going across the gate or across the driveway, um, there is special wire that we need to buy to put underground. Um, if you're going under a driveway, um, what I like to do is take a piece of PVC pipe or maybe some old water line or something and shove that wire through there. So if I need to replace it, I don't have to dig it up again, but it also help protect that wire a little bit, especially if you're putting gravel around it. But use the, use the right wire to get through those gates. Does all wire carry the same charge? No, um, <clears throat> we wanna use wire for fencing. Um, if we did copper, copper wire actually wouldn't make that good of a um, fence wire for electric. Um, it's great going to the house, don't get me wrong, but copper actually carries that charge inside the wire. We want wire made for fence where it carries the charge on the outside of that wire. And then also with that picture there in the middle, we don't want to electrify barbed wire. Um, kind of think of the charge in um, barbed wire like you're running water through it. And every time it hits one of those barbs, it's coming to a dead end. So it'll, it'll kind of take some of the life out of your um, charge. So just don't use um, barbed wire for electric fence. You know, the, down here on the left, this electric netting will work, works really well for sheep and goat producers that they tell me. Um, if we're going to be dividing up those paddocks, that works great for that. What Rory was talking about, or if we're using this poly wire, you can use these spools that you can purchase. Um, actually, what I do is I take a piece of um, took a piece of all thread, put it through these spools after I put the wire out, put it in my electric drill, and I roll it back up on the same spool that I bought it on. It's not as perfect as when it come off, but it does work for me. So. Um, but then you can just divide these pastures up any way you want to. Um, be very adaptable with them. It works out really well. Posts, all kinds of posts out there. Wood, steel, fiberglass, whatever you prefer. You can mix and match them. Um, a lot of folks will use wood and, and combine um, steel posts with it. And that's perfectly fine. Um, if you're going to be stretching high tensile wire, you will need one of these devices to unspool that. You only un undo a spool of high tensile wire once and it comes apart like a slinky and it just turns into a real mess. Um, so find somebody that's got one of these or make one yourself, but those are a must if you're going to be unstringing some high tensile wire. The pigs in this picture, you can see they've got hog panels around there, but if you know anything about pigs, I don't care how many posts you put on that panel, they're still going to lift it up out of the ground. So you can see that they've got the let that electro netting inside there. Um, so the combination of the two works out pretty well. Okay, just going to spend a second here on staples. Um, this is probably another common mistake that um, and I didn't know it until a few several years ago. But with the staples, we can get them from three quarters of an inch up to two inches. Um, there you can see the barbless ones or the single barbed one or this double barbed one over here. These are the ones that I really like, um, especially if we're using them on um, something like some of these soft pine posts. They hold up fairly well for me. Um, <clears throat> but you need to know whether you have a right-handed staple or a left-handed staple. Um, the way you tell is if you are holding one of these staples in your hand, okay, with the, the points pointing towards your fingers, if you had that laying in your palm, if you can see where this is, the, this edge is cut. If you had this in the palm of your hand pointing forward, that would be cut on the right side. That's a right-handed staple or as in this diagram showing a right cut staple so if you have a right-handed staple, you'd want to turn that staple to two o'clock when you drive it into the post or 30 to 45 degrees to the right. If you've got a left cut or a left-handed staple, you want to put that one in at 10 o'clock or 30 to 45 degrees to the left. 
because what we want to happen is when you drive that staple in, that staple will spread. You know, to give you a better hold with that wire. If you put it in backwards, those two barbs are going to cover cross each other, and it's not going to be a real good hold um, to hold into that post. And if you're putting the wire on the wrong end, um, you're just setting yourself up for disaster there. <laughs> and they do make um, battery-operated hand staplers that holds these fence staples. Um, folks tell me that they work really well, um, and it gives you a good, consistent depth when you drive that staple in. You don't want to drive those staples in tight against the wire. I don't, regardless of whether you're putting up um, woven wire or electric wire, um, you want to give that wire a chance to contract and expand with different weather conditions. Okay. Insulators, all kinds of different insulators out there. <clears throat> I particularly um, have just went to using these bullnose um, insulators on the electric wire. Um, I have used these plastic ones that wrap around the post in these pictures, um, but I found that they break down, they, they crack, um, and just don't hold up where these bullnose um, insulators work really well. You can get these in um, ceramic or plastic. Um, ceramic would probably hold up a little longer for you, probably be a little more expensive. Um, but if you drop them on the shop floor, they don't last real long that way. Um, and then also with these learn to tie high tensile wire, there's three or four different knots that you need to know. Um, but it's a lot better tying that high tensile wire off than using those crimps. Um, I can never get them to hold, so I finally figured out how to tie the wire and, and have been doing that, and it works out a lot better. Um, these round insulators too, um, not a big fan of them. I mean, I've got them on my place. Don't get me wrong, my place is the museum of how not to do fencing. Um, but sometimes if the staple comes loose and they'll slide down the wire and you got to trace them down or if the wire's cut and you forget to put one back on, um, these work pretty slick that you can just screw in to the post. Um, sometimes these pegs will get broken, but you can just put something else back out in there. But if one has happened to break, it's real easy just to slap a new one on there and, um, keep moving, but I don't know how long those are going to last. Haven't been using them that long. So, corner posts. Corner pro posts are probably the biggest failure in most fence systems, and at least in my opinion, um, there's a lot of different ways of putting fence posts in these corner posts. Um, most of the time, what people do is what you see here in this bottom middle picture. The rule of thumb is that if you have whatever distance you have in the height of this post above ground, you want two and a half times that length in your horizontals. Okay, so if I had four foot of post sticking above ground, I'd want a horizontal that's 10 foot. Okay, this is perfectly fine for semi-permanent here with these, these um, metal posts, those work fine. Um, these corner posts done this way, um, they work. I'm just not a big fan of them. This one at the this individual concreted clear to the top, I wouldn't recommend doing that because possibility of freezing that up out of the ground in the winter. And this one just isn't going to hold up um, over time that long. These are a couple examples. These are actually from my place. Um, this is what a meeting we had a few years ago. One of the fence companies said that they're going to that they found it's a lot stouter. Um, this cross member necessarily doesn't have to be wood. A lot of them using pipe. But in the past, I've always put mine at the top, but their recommendation was to put this about two thirds of the way up. And then this um, brace wire, you'd want it at a 30 degree angle, okay? And they, they said that this one will hold, hold more strain than a lot of the others. Um, I just did this a couple years ago, um, holding up good so far, but again, I hadn't been in there that long. Another trick that I've learned some, from some folks is if you got some old um, lag, um, hinges that screw into posts. It's really nice to screw those into the bottom of this post on the other side so that gate can rest on top of that and it'll also help hold it open. And then if you put one on where the gate latches, it'll help hold that gate in place and help hold that weight off of that post. Um, what the fencing company said that they like doing too is putting, you know, a lot of people will put the fence on the end so you can swing that gate either way but it'll put a lot less pressure on these end posts if you have it where that gate will only swing one way. So whether it's opened or closed, it's not putting a lot of pressure um, on this corner brace to hold it. These double H braces, again, I put, put them in on my place, found that I really don't, not a big fan of them. 
if you're going to do it this way, you got to be really careful and make sure that you've got this center post dead center of these two. Because if you've got it out of whack a little bit, it'll push that post one way or the other. Or if you don't have these lined up right and braced right, um, it's going to pop on this middle one up out of there, or maybe even these in the, on the end. So um, can be done. Um, just not a big fan of them, just because this, just doing this longer post or pipe, uh, just a lot easier way to go and a little stouter. So that's what I'd recommend you do. Post. <clears throat> excuse me, post spacing. Um, a lot of people say that we had put too many posts in the ground, that if we do our corners right, um, we can really stretch that wire pretty tight um, and do like these folks, I keep looking at the wrong screen, do like these folks do, you can just put these stays in between them. These aren't buried into the ground, they're just in to help hold that spacing between the wire, okay? So you can stretch those posts out a little farther yeah, on flat ground, it's a lot easier. Those of us down here in southeastern Ohio, yeah, we've got some terrain that we've got to put in a lot more posts than what we wanted. Um, obviously, if you're putting in some wood posts, you gotta, you're going to have to space them. Probably about eight foot is going to be about the longest you can go just because of the dimension of the lumber that we can get. Um, here's just an example of a water gate. Um, real simple one. This one's not going to snag a lot of trash. It's coming down that cracker stream. Um, these stays or these wires hanging down, those are electrified. Um, a lot of guys will just put a switch um, at the edge of that fence line. So if a rain has come in, they just walk out there and flip that off. So there's no juice on this and it's not grounding their charger till it rains. Again, this down here in the bottom left corner, looks like that's more of a life or a wildlife exclusion with the height of it, of what it is. Um, but the corner posts are in, put in pretty good, you know, fairly decent spacing. Um, probably gonna be a good fence. Fence tension, <clears throat> a lot of different tensioners out there. Um, these ratchets are nice, they work well. Um, not a problem with those. These daisy wheels work really well. It's just, if you're gonna be using these daisy wheels, be real careful um, using them. There's a tool that you slide into the center of those and start twisting to tighten that wire up. And if you lose your grip, there's a lot of guys that's gotten smacked in the chin with them and um, it doesn't feel good, but there's just a little pin right here, a U-shaped pin that you put in there through those holes to hold that tension on there. Um, these gripples, I've used them. Um, not a big fan of them. I mean, they're great if you're in a hurry and need a quick fix to put a fence back together. Um, but I've got a two-strand hot wire that's on my between my pasture field and my hay field, and I've had deer run through them, and they will strip those out. Um, you can put them right back together. It's not, a, not that big of an issue, um, but just be aware that um, deer can pull them out. Um, the nice thing about them though, is if a lot of um, orchards or if you're growing berries or some crop that you need to pull that wire apart. So if you're gonna do some pruning or something, you can take these apart fairly easy and put them back, to, you know, take that wire down, do your pruning or whatever you need to do and put them back together. Those work excellent for that. Um, in the ends of them, I don't know whether this is gonna work or not. But if you can see right there on the end, that little hole there's a tool that you put on here um, to tighten those and you just put a little tension on it and then you can take a, they, they sell you a special tool to put in there, but I just use a small um, Allen wrench to jam in there because it'll release the pressure off that little wheel that's in there that holds it. And then that's how you can just slide those apart um, and it works real slick. The same company that makes these, this is Gripples. Um, they make these little connectors that you can put on the end of woven wire. You just put one end in there and it's got like two little fingers that you put over this horizontal stay to hold it so you don't have to go down through there and um, tie all those wires off. Um, if you're gonna get serious about fence building, they do make a tool that will fit on the end of your cordless drill that you can lay on and it'll just wrap those wires right around there for you just really slick and quick. Um, I've used a quarter inch box end wrench before. You can just take a flat piece of steel and drill a hole in it, tie those off if you want. Um, it's whatever your preference is. This chain tightener here, um, real handy if you're going to be doing a lot of work with high tensile wire. It's got these two um, where the wire snaps into or where it tightens up on the wire and then these, these two legs here that will just walk up that chain to tighten them up. Um, if you're working with high tensile and you want to tighten it up and actually put a figure eight knot in there instead of putting a connector on it, um, these work really slick for that, okay? Fence tension, um, 
They do have these tension springs. I've used them before, um, probably will not again, um, just because of the added expense. But if you are using these, they, they will tell you that if you get an inch of compression on these, um, on this spring, that's equal to about 150 pounds, okay? Look at what whatever the recommendations are from whatever French um, company you're buying from. Um, a lot of folks will tell you, you know, 100, 150 is plenty. Um, same may go up higher than that, but boy, you better have your corner posts in solid and you better have them in right. Um, in runs greater than 600 foot, you'd want to put these these tensioners in the middle of that. Um, even if, if it's only 600 foot and it's not a straight line, I would still put it in the center up. So you're pulling tension equally on both from both corners. Um, I just really don't like putting the, the ratchets at the very end anyway. Um, if you're putting up the woven wire, these tension curves is what you want to watch when you're straightening or um, tightening that fence up. Most places will say you want about a third to a half compression on that. And if you're one that really goes by the numbers, they do sell these tools. You put this um, spring underneath the wire and these both other end, both ends hook on it. You start tightening it up and then it'll tell you how tight that fence is if you really want to be exact. These two ratchets here, this is one that I've just found. I've never used it, but they've got the bullnose insulator right on it. Um, might be useful in some instances. This is a newer one that I really like. I haven't used it yet, but at the very end of this, we used to cut the wire and stick it through here and then we'd either tie it off or put a crimp on it. They've actually put an opening at this end right here so you can slide your high tensile wire straight through that ratchet. And if you're gonna electrify it, it works out great. We're not cutting it. You know, it's not another break point in that wire if we're trying to electrify it. Just slide it on there um, and then just start cranking on it tight. Um, I think it's a pretty slick idea. <clears throat> not a help with um, energizing your fence or not losing um, any of your power out of your fence. <clears throat> okay, water. Um, this could be another whole hour's talk, but uh, we kind of condensed it down. Um, water, you know, Roy was talking about, you know, the more paddocks you can have, the better. And a lot of times it's the water that's our limiting factor of being able to do that. Um, we we want to get the water to where the animals can get to it and access it easily. Um, there's different types of waters and I'll show you some pictures. Um, here's a nice heavy use pad. It's got a frost free water on it, which is important in the winter time. Um, these tanks work great, but you can see, you know, everybody's got a smart aleck that likes to get in the middle of them. And the problem with animals being able to get in the middle of them, they're going to break off our inlet and our outlet pipes um, and just kind of create a mess, let alone them bringing in mud and other stuff into that tank for the animals to drink out of. You know, putting in some um, geotextiles, some stone around these waters is important. <clears throat> you know, keep this kind of incident happening. Um, <clears throat> I'd say this is one that has a float on it, and I'd say that float probably stuck um, and just created a mess there. So, um, what a, I'll just show you a few pictures of them here. We can get our water from a lot of different sources, ponds, springs, streams, wells, public water. Um, some folks do haul water that's pretty time consuming and expensive. Um, cisterns um, can be used. Actually, that's what we have down at Bell Valley is a cistern. They're pumping water out of a pond up on top high on the hill. And a lot of you seen it when we was down there um, or heard about it when we was down there for our, um, our ag meeting here a couple summers ago, um, but it, that works. But different ones have advantages, disadvantages, different prices. Um, obviously, a pond um, of any fairly size is, you know, is going to be really expensive to build um, if you got the right place to put one in. Um, spring developments work great. Um, drill on the well, um, not a real option for a lot of us down in this area because all the mining that happened. Um, so a lot of other springs and, and streams for us in this area. Um, but, it, you know, the public water supply may be an option, but depending on um, what your water costs are going to be there. But certainly drill on the well is an option. Um, this individual was going to install a windmill on this, which they work great as long as we've got the wind. Um, a lot of guys will just put in um, pump houses with them, and I'll show you an example of that here in a second. Um, this is ideally what we want to look at. Here we've got a stream crossing here. We've got some stone in the bottom of that stream crossing. We're limiting the access of cattle to that stream. Um, 
A lot of farmers will give you pushback on this because they don't want to lose that ground along that stream. Um, but this individual, he's just got up kind of a semi-permanent um, fence or actually more of a temporary fence in late August or September. He'll go in there and take that wire down when it's drier, let the cattle graze that off a little bit. If he needs to mow that bank a little bit to keep it cleaned up, then he'll take care of that and then put the fence back up. Um, but a lot of guys just don't want to give that up to letting trees and stuff grow on that bank and it's a hard sell. So you want to sit down with your producers. Um, I believe this one's what Cliff put together. Um, but here's an outlay of this individual's farm. Okay, we need to look at you know where are we going to put our pastures at? Where's our water sources at? Um, what time of the year they're going to be where? How much water are we as each animal going to um, drink? That's certainly going to be fluctuating with the temperatures, the size of the animal, what are they eating, um, and all that stuff. But the way they developed this farm is they've got four permanent pasture fields here. They've got two fields here that they can hay or graze them. You know, here's their water sources so they can get the, to them from all, all these pastures fairly easily. And here they've determined where their winter feeding is. I would guess that it's well protected in amongst these trees this field is. And probably this may be the only one where they got a frost free spigot to put in there. You know, some of these open ones, these open tanks do freeze off if we ever have a winter. Um, so you just certainly want to be cognizant of that um, when you're helping folks lay out their pasture fields. But every farm's different. <laughs> Here's an example here. This was a um, fall cabin herd, 50 calves. They treated them as stalkers, weaned them on grass. All right, on 25 acres, they did use that man uh, managed intensive grazing that Rory was talking about earlier today. Um, but they had to travel 1,200 feet from the paddocks to get to the streams. So they did drill a well. They did get cost share on this, not quite half of it. They did fence the animals out of the woods, but what they found at the end of the year that they put an additional 50 pound on each of those calves. So that's an additional 2,500 pound for the summer. So just easily take a dollar a pound. Hopefully they're bringing more than that, um, but almost paid that off in the first year. And then also with the intensive grazing is you don't want a great big water tank um, for each of those paddocks that you got to move around trying to dump a five full 500 gallon water tank is pretty difficult. Um, use something that's big enough that it'll recharge so they can all get plenty of water, but something small enough it's easy to take down, move, and clean. Okay, that's important when doing on some of these um, intensive management grazing systems. How far away from the water do you want these animals? Um, some of the work that's been done over the years, as you can see in this chart, just showing you, you know, here's how much their utilization rate. So they were using about 70% of that pasture so they didn't have to walk more than 100 foot. We get out here to this 1100 feet, you know, not even 10% of total utilization of those pastures. So ideally, most of the time, what you'll see people tell you is you'll want those, no, those animals having to walk no further than between 500 to 800 feet to get to the water. Um, some of the other issues was that what these are herding animals. So if they have to walk this 1100 feet, the boss animal takes off walking, she or he will get a drink and when they're done, they're heading back. And that timid animal may not even have a chance to, to get a drink where if they're close enough that they can see each other, not a real far distance, they'll go all back and forth to the water individually um, and we'll get some more pounds put on them. So. Um, if at all possible, try to keep those waters within that distance. Here's a study out of Canada that they did. The dugout is a pond, okay? I mean, what they're giving these animals is the water from that pond. The trough is the same water, so they're pumping that water out of the pond. But you can see that those that had to drink from the pond itself didn't gain quite as well as those that were in the trough. Couple reasons for that is that animals drinking in a pond, you know, the first one goes in, they step in it, they're stirring up the mud. So the second one it goes in, they've got to go out just a little bit farther. Um, probably not as clean of water. And if we are taking water out of ponds, where is the cleanest water in ponds? Where do we normally draw water from? We'd want to draw it from about two foot below the surface. Okay, we don't want to drag it off the bottom. We're just going to pick up mud but generally would float a floating device out there and take that water from about two foot down. Here's an example of a pond that they're using for water here. They've installed a little um, pump in here with a pressure tank, and then they can just bury lines and run it, you know, right out this ridge. Um, works out really well for them. Um, and they can move that water about wherever they want to. 
So again, here's that number, five to 600 feet. You can go a little bit further than that if you want to. Um, but if you are gonna do that intensive grazing, smaller tanks with a quick recharge is what we'd want. All kinds of creative folks out there with what they're using for water. Here, these used heavy equipment tires work really well. Um, the biggest, the hardest thing with these is cutting the bead out of the middle of them. Um, most guys that I've worked with, if they've got a front end loader um, or a backer or something that they can put a piece of pipe through the center of this and pull up on it, take the pressure off it once they get that bead started, helps make that job a little easier. Um, when they put these in, then they'll concrete the bottom of it um, and works out really well. Here's a larger tank here. We're splitting it between these two fields. Um, <coughs> In the wintertime, don't know how, how well that will work with, the, the, with it freezing up on you, but for the, for the summertime, certainly um, big enough tank to handle a lot of animals, and you can see they've got a good footing around there, so that is um, one way of doing it. This, I know, happens to be Chris's farm here. Um, he's got a spring that's not real productive, um, especially in the fall. So what he did, he, he just simply put in two tanks, um, put the overflow into to another one. So when the animals come to drink, he's got plenty of water for all of them at once. Um, and then when they come back, that, that spring has had enough time to recharge those tanks and works out pretty slick for him. Just another example here. The only caution here would be this one's on a float system. And again, we get one of those rogue animals that jumps in there and breaks that off. Um, this could turn into a real mess. Um, just something to be cognizant about. And here's one way some folks have uh, addressed that issue. They didn't take the bead out of the center. Um, here you can see the overflow and, and, and the drain pipe up underneath this to help protect it. And they just cut out a few areas. Um, so there's different creative ways that we can get in using these old tires. Um, biggest challenge is just making sure we get the bottom of them sealed with the concrete correctly so they don't leak. The underground ones, these work really well too. Um, we bury these in dirt just so it'll protect that water, keep it from freezing through the winter time. Um, here's a different type of geotextile fabric. You know, we fill that full of berm or, or screenings. Um, so it gives a real good footing for the animals when they walk over it. But um, here's another one of those buried tanks. These are a couple of like, these are like some of them that we have down at the research farm over at Bell Valley back in the pasture fields. Um, bury these tanks underground, water lines coming in from the back of them. And then eventually, We'll want to put a put some um, a, some boards up just to keep that this embankment from falling down. Cows walking on it, taking that dirt off the top, losing that insulation. Um, good footing here around it. Um, work out pretty well. These frost-free hydrants here, they work really. Or this um, water here, if you do are able to run electric to it, they'll do okay for you in the winter time. Um, but in this instance, they went ahead and put in another water hydrant just in case that they would need it. And that, they did take a garden hose and, and run it around and just to make up, break up the paddocks, a couple other areas, um, and get more use out of the water being on this part of the farm. A lot of folks, will, you need to protect these waters, these type, um, they will rub on them. Um, so protecting them in some way, some fashion does help. Um, and some of the water that you're using, they may need to be trained. This one has these balls or these floats in them um, to help hold in the heat in the winter time. So you need to train those animals. Doesn't take a lot of uh, training, but you need to train them to push down on those to get to the water. And once you get one or two of them going with it, um, the rest of them seem to follow pretty quick. And then again, when those intensive grazing systems, something small enough to recharge fast enough, you know, these smaller ones are easy to clean, easier to move. Um, and they all have a different price tag on them, obviously. I'm not sure on these NRC payments, whether those are up to date. I'd have to double check on that. I don't know with the new farm bill, um, what's coming out there, but there is cost share assistance available to help with those. And again, back to the water and, and Roy's um, intensive grazing, you know, with this one water, we can use utilize four paddocks with it. And we just put this temporary wire around it um, to keep them out of there. Those other paddocks to move them where we want to move them to, when we want to move them to. And you know, if we wanted to put in a lane system, same thing, temporary wire here in red, um, then we can just rotate these animals through these eight paddocks. Again, two different waters, two lane systems, or two um, paddocks to a water. We're offsetting these because we don't want, you know, we're going to be tramping up both areas of the field here. So, you know, separating them out this way works well. Um, with gates, again, all kinds of different gating systems out there. We can put in these cattle guards. Um, 
few people that have them. The secret to these is making sure you've got that gap underneath them. Again, cat, cattle or livestock don't have real good depth perception, perception so it's that shadow underneath there that kind of keeps them from wanting to walk over that. Um, these drive over gates, don't know of anybody using those, but they are out there. Or if you just want to put in a small gating system or a cattle guard for your ATV to move around. And then just the old fashioned wire gates, um, you know, they work just depending on what kind of livestock you got. But then or, you know, most people are using these metal gates. And uh, this picture just reminds me, yeah, never fail. As soon as you put up a new gate, you got some little kid comes out and jumps on it and bends it, right? Um, but gate placement is important. Um, you know, if we want to make sure they're high enough that the animals can't get over. So, you know, if you got a favorite pet out there in the field, it always wants to go in the house with you. Um, she didn't quite make it. But gate placement is important. We want to put the gates, if we've got a corral or an area in our fields, it's really nice if we can put those gates in the corners. A lot easier to move the livestock around. Um, you know, the old cows that have been around for years, they know the system, but, you know, for this, we had a pasture or gating, we were trying to bring them through here. The cows know to go in, the cow goes this way, and the calves don't miss the gate, and they're just running around here, and it's just real pain to get them go through, where if we've got it in a corner somewhere, um, a lot easier to move them through it. Um, of course, we've all had that one that decided to put a new gate in wherever they wanted to, um, but hopefully we can get them in and give them a happy trailer ride. Um, double gates, these work pretty well too. You're, you can put smaller gates up on your corner post or your end post, um, don't have so much weight. And they work really nice if you've got an alleyway like this here. So whichever way you're bringing them, you can swing one of the gates open to try and direct them inside there. Um, it's not gonna block the entire alleyway off, um, but at least it'll help give them visually a direction to go. Your working pins, um, you know, if you're going to have livestock, you're eventually going to have a sick one. I hope no, you never do, but it's just the way things go. Um, no matter what livestock you got, big livestock, small livestock, um, you're going to need some sick pens and some working facilities. And if you can at all um, put them under roof, that works out really well, um, especially like in the last couple of years. I mean, sometimes when we're working livestock, it's timely, but um, you know, a lot of times it's in the middle of when we're going, trying to get some field work done. So if it does it is raining and we can't get out in the field, at least we got a roof over our head and we can still work livestock um, and move through it fairly easily. Two of the more common systems, especially for cattle um, that are out there, this circular system was invented by Temple Grandin. Um, she's got a lot of stuff on her website um, that's really neat, um, just, you know, just constantly moving them cattle, not giving them, um, being able to see the end point um, works pretty slick. The other one is this bud box design. The cattle would come in this way. Most of the time when we run cattle into a pen like this, they'll want to turn around and come back out the way they came in. Where if you shut this gate, this one's just an example one, that you can load them out onto a trailer one way or you can run them down the chute on the other but you just go up in here and close the gate behind them, get them to move up that alleyway. And when that gate closes, it's just an extension of that alleyway. Um, the number of animals you put in these, um, Dr. Boyles will tell you, you know, if this tub would hold 10 animals, you put five in it. Half full is full because you'll get it, you know, invariably if you try to cram 10 in there, there's going to be one smart aleck that backs in the alleyway this way. None of them can move. You're getting agitated. They're getting, um, stirred up so put fewer animals in it most of the time it'll go a lot smoother for you and it'll actually be faster do we need to fence out livestock livestock or, or wildlife are certainly an issue for us you know with sheep and goats coyotes can be a problem an issue i don't think we've got bear problems around here yet but another one for our some of our high dollar fruit and vegetable crops um deer fencing um it gets expensive, but boy, some folks in some areas, that's just the only last resort they've got to keep the deer out so they're gonna eventually wind up with a crop. And then here's the website to Peggy Hall's um, fact sheet. It's on her website, real easy to find. Um, Peggy did a really nice job putting that together. Um, real easy read of understanding the new fence line law. Um, so if you got producers that come in, um, just a great resource. And then just finally, what I tell them producers, you know, look at work with your neighbors or local other local producers. Um, that's the nice thing about doing pasture walks. You know, I think I learn more from these working with these producers than they do for me. Um, but just getting them together because every farm is different. Every situation is a little bit different. 
fencing companies. There's a lot of really good YouTube um, videos online from fencing companies and some of these um, fencers. Um, you can get on there that you can figure out how to tie high tensile wire um, and how to build fence and what other products are out there. And then, you know, finally, let's just do our field days, trade shows, farm science review. And, and again, that's something that we're hoping that we can highlight in the livestock area this year is fencing. Um, but then each of you, and I thank each of you for being on. That is the last slide that I have, 